Section 12, Conduit Fill of the Canadian Electrical Code, Part 1. In this presentation, we're going to be focusing on 12.9.10, which is calculating conduit size. Now, Table 6 and 9 could be used when all conductors are the same size. However, it only shaves one step from the conduit fill process, and due to that, we are not going to be focusing on the use of Table 6 because it will not take into account every single application. Now, Table 8, 9, and 10 can be used for all situations be it the conductors all being the same size or varying sizes within one conduit. So this is the process that we'll be focused on within this presentation. Now information required for conduit sizing is most obviously the AUG size, how large, how large are the conductors, and secondly, the insulation type. The material of the insulation and the voltage rating will determine how thick the insulation is, and that will have a large bearing on how many conductors can fit inside a conduit. Now, it's important to understand that although conduits are standard in trade size, their usable internal area will vary. Now, conduit sizes and their area are found in tables 9A to H. And if we take a look at a cross section for a 35 millimeter inch and a quarter conduit, 100% of its internal area, we can see that there is a massive fluctuation in area from a RTRCID, so that's a thermoplastic reinforced resin type of fiberglass conduit, to this one, RTRCIPS, 1140 millimeters squared. And then look at all these, EMT 940, PVC 792, I mean, they're all over the place. And because of that, we need to be able to determine the exact number of conductors for the exact type of raceway that we plan to install. Tables 9A and B are the same calculated value as in 100% of the internal area. However, there's two tables simply because there are so many different types of conduits available to us. There are 15 different conduits, and due to that, they needed two tables in order to give all the information. The vertical columns indicate the type of raceway that we're dealing with. It indicates the internal millimeters, internal diameter, and also the millimeter squared, which is the one that we will use for the conduit fill calculations. Anywhere that you see a line like this indicates that the conduit is not manufactured in that trade size. So table 9 and A and B is 100%. C and D is 53%. E and F is 31%, and G and H is 40%. Now, 40% of the internal area, it's already been calculated for you, and I'm going to just tell you that 40%, tables 9, G and H, are the two that will be used the most while doing conduit fill calculations. Now, although conductors are standard in AUG size, their occupied area varies due to the insulation and the conductor construction. So conductor area is provided in tables 9A to D, and D5, so that's in Appendix D, based on the conductor type. So if we take a look here, this is number 14 odd conductors, and I'm showing the area of number 14 odd conductor for four different types of conductor construction. We have 10A, which is stranded, 600 volt unjacketed, 10B, solar PV, unjacketed, 1000 volt, solid conductor, unjacketed, and then RW90 DLO. Look at the difference between the areas that they take up. From a DLO to a solid 14 gauge, I mean, that's more than, it's more than double. It's more than three times the size. It's crazy. So let's take a look at these tables, see what the difference is between each. 10A is dimensions of stranded insulated conductors. So this is the most common type of building wire that we're going to have. This column over here, notice the little asterisk, that denotes that this is unjacketed. So you always need to determine, is it jacketed or unjacketed? Jacketed is far thicker. And so if you take a look at the note at the end of this table, it will indicate jacketed and unjacketed. Otherwise, if you look at this column here and this column here, they both seem to look identical other than the actual areas listed. So that's important to keep in mind. 10B is for solar photovoltaic insulated conductors. And so this is for solar PV applications. The voltages are typically much higher and the cables are typically sunlight resistant and intended to be in installed outside where the uh, environment, wind, water, and uh, rain will be in direct contact with it. And because of that, it is a much thicker insulation. 10C is a very small table. This is for solid conductors. And you'll notice that it only goes from 14 gauge to 10 gauge because we don't typically use solid conductors beyond those sizes. Table 10D is for DLO or diesel locomotive cable, which is a highly flexible cab tire type of cable. And it is due to it being highly flexible and lots of insulation on the outside is very thick. 
Finally, table D5 and appendix D, this is for different stranding of conductors without insulation. And so typically this is only used for uninsulated grounding conductors inside a conduit or bonding conductors. So what's a conduit fill process? Well, one, two, and three steps. We have to first start in table 10 and look up the conductor area for each conductor size in the conduit. Step two, find the total area, and that's where you multiply and add them all together. Step three, table eight, identify the percent fill permitted for the conduit. And this is table eight. It's actually two separate rows. The row that we use the most is this, insulated conductors or multi-conductor cables, not lead sheathed. So that's the top here. So if you have one conductor in the conduit, 53% is as much as you can uh, fill the conduit. If you have two conductors, you can go to 31%. And beyond that, three conductors, four and over four is all 40%. And so you can see here that obviously in most situations, we're working with a 40% fill option. So after we determine the percent fill permitted for the conduit table eight, step four, five, and six, identify the table for the required percent fill. So that's table nine, A to H. And I said, typically we're looking at G and H because that's 40% fill. Step five, follow down the column in the table for the conduit until the area listed meets or exceeds the calculated conductor area from step two, way up there. And then finally, step six, we'll follow along the row to the left until we find the conduit size listed. So let's go for, Go through two examples. First example is 10 number 12s, 8 number 10s. They're all RW90, 600 volt, XLPE, unjacketed in EMT. And I put a note here, they are stranded conductors. First step, we're going to go to table 10A and we're going to look up the area for those conductors. So we look in the unjacketed vertical column, RW90, and we're looking in the area column, and we're looking for 12 and 10 gauge. So 12 gauge is 11.61, 10 gauge is 15.67. We bring that back and we're going to have to multiply those out. 11.61 times 10, 15.67 times 8. We bring those over as a subtotal and then we got to add them together. And that's why I'm saying you multiply then you add them. So the total is 241.46 millimeters squared. We then go to table 8. And remember table 8 is simply going to tell us what percent fill we can fill the conduit up to. Well, we're at over four conductors, so we're in the 40% fill maximum. That means we now get to choose which table nine. And the table nine that we have to choose from is either G or H. And the difference between G or H is just which conduit are you working with? We're working with EMT, which happens to be located in table nine G. So we're going to take the 241.46 over to table nine G. And we're going to find EMT, which is over here. And we're going to go down this column until we find a number that meets or exceeds 241.46 millimeters squared. And that gets us down to 376.1. I can't use a 215.65, which is the uh, row right above. And that's simply because I need a minimum 241.46. We then follow along horizontally to the left until we find the trade size conduit, 35 millimeter. So inch and a quarter conduit. Uh, EMT is required for 18 of these particular conductors in this installation. Next example is 10 number 12s, 8 number 10s, and 1 14 gauge, which is going to be an insulated bonding conductor. They are going to be RW9600 volt XLPE unjacketed in rigid PVC, and they're going to be solid conductors. First step, go to table 10 and decide which of the four tables we're going to choose, and that would be 10C for solid conductors. And we go to the vertical column that indicates the unjacketed 600 volt RW90. And we look up the area for a 14, 12, and 10 gauge. Now we're going to take these values back. So 7.78 millimeters squared, 10.02, and 13.25. We're going to take them back to our little tally sheet. And we're going to multiply them out and then add them all up to get a total. So 10 number 12s, 10 times 10.02. 8 number 10, so 8 times 13.25, and 1. Uh, 14 gauge was 7.78. Then we're going to add them all together to 13.98 millimeters squared. We then take that to table eight. And guess what? Lo and behold, it is 40% column that we're going to use. So we go back and now we know which of the table nines that we're going to select from. And this being rigid PVC happens to also be in table 9G. And remember 9G because we're looking for 40% fill. So we're going to take the 213.98 millimeters squared over to table 9G for the rigid PVC. 
and we're going to find a size of conduit. So there we are in rigid PVC. We're going to go down the 40% column until we reach a number that meets or exceeds 219.45, and we end up at a 316.69. Bring that over. Huh. Looks like it's the same conduit size again, 35 millimeter. And that means inch and a quarter rigid PVC for 19 of these particular conductors in this situation.